Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, we're going to discuss the topic of NumPy arrays. We'll first start off by exploring how we actually create NumPy arrays. There's lots of different methods we can create NumPy arrays, but we're going to focus on three main methods that we use here and throughout the course. One is just transforming a standard Python list to a NumPy array. The second is using a variety of built-in functions. And the third is being able to generate random data in whatever shape you want using NumPy. And then once we learn how to create NumPy arrays, we'll have a brief discussion of some key attributes of these NumPy arrays. Let's get started by heading over to a Jupyter Notebook. Okay, here I am at a new Jupyter Notebook. The first thing to know that when we're using NumPy, we have to import it. If you've already followed along with our installation process, then you should have NumPy installed on your computer. If not, you can check out the notebook that corresponds with this lecture for various ways of installing NumPy. It should be easy just to install with conda install NumPy or pip install NumPy, where you run that at your command line. Once you've already installed it, go ahead and type out import NumPy in all lowercase as, and then by convention, we import NumPy as NP. And then you should be able to say NP dot in a new cell, hit tab, and you'll realize that there's a bunch of import calls or functions or classes available for us within NumPy. We definitely won't be using all of these. We'll just show you the most useful ones. Okay, so we've imported NumPy. Now let's start off by learning how to actually create a NumPy array. One way we can do this is directly transforming or converting a Python list. For example, if I say my list is equal to a standard Python list of one, two, three, and then I check the type of my list, it's currently just a list type. To transform something into a NumPy array, I can say NP array, and then pass in what I want to transform. And now you'll notice the output looks different. It now outputs it, showing that it's a NumPy array. Keep in mind, this doesn't actually affect the original list. My list is still just a normal Python list. We'd have to reassign it to something like my array is equal to NP array of my list. And then if we check out my array, as well as confirming the type of my array, you'll notice is a NumPy array. Now we can also expand on this, not just for a one dimensional vector, but also for something that looks two dimensional. For example, let's create an object called my matrix. And this will be a list of lists, essentially a nested list in Python. So we can say one, two, three, next list inside of this can be four, five, six, and then next list is seven, eight, nine. And if you take a look at my matrix, notice that right now it's just a normal Python list and there's three items in this Python list. Each item in the list is another list with another three items. Now look what happens when we actually pass this as a NumPy array. If we say np.array and then say my matrix, notice that NumPy already has fundamental to it this idea that this is two dimensional, that it's actually three rows by three columns. And that's gonna be a key idea of NumPy and using it to actually manipulate and have capabilities and functions apply to two dimensional data sets. Typically, we actually just won't be using or casting Python standard lists into a NumPy array. Instead, we'll be using built-in functions and built-in methods with NumPy. So let's go through a couple of these. One of the most useful ones is np.arrange. Notice it just has one R. And this is essentially the equivalent in NumPy to Python's built-in range function. So what we do here is you can say shift tab, you provide a start, a stop, and then an optional step size. So we can say start at zero, comma, and then go all the way up to, but not including 10, and it creates a NumPy array for us that starts at zero and then goes all the way up to, but not including 10. So here we have zero, one, two, three, all the way to nine. And then optionally, what we can do is we can add a step size. So as a third parameter here, I could say comma two, and then it says go from zero up to, but not including 10 in a step size of two. So jumping by two, we go zero, two, four, six, eight, et cetera. So you can imagine that if I said something like 101, in a step size of two, it goes zero, two, four, six, eight, all the way to, but not including 101, so it stops at 100. So then we could expand on this, maybe take step sizes of 20. 
and then it goes 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, etc. Main thing to note here is that it goes up to, but not including, that stopping point. It's also really common to have to create large arrays of zeros and ones when dealing with realistic data sets. And we can do this with NumPy by saying NP zeros. And if you do shift tab here, it basically asks you what the shape required is. So if you just pass in a single number such as five, it produces a one dimensional vector of zeros. Note that these zeros are actually floating point numbers. By default, NumPy often uh, returns back things as floating point numbers in order to preserve some sort of precision. So be careful of the fact that you may see zero dot. It's just indicating that it's a floating point number. Now, if we wanted this to be a two dimensional array, what we could say is NP zeros and then pass in as a tuple a shape of something like five by five. And now I can see that I have five rows by five columns. Note that the first number here denotes the number of rows. So let's say I wanted two rows by five columns. I would just pass in a tuple of two by five. Run that, and now I have two rows by five columns. Keep in mind this idea of shapes being defined by the number of rows first, and then the number of columns second. That's gonna be used all the time, especially when we start learning about uh, two-dimensional data sets with pandas. Okay, now there's also NP1s, which is very similar. So same thing here, if you do shift tab, you provide the shape and you can say something like, I want four by four and it returns back four by four ones. And if you only pass in one number here, then it just returns back a 1D vector of that many ones. Another useful function for creating a NumPy array is the linspace function. So we can say np.linspace and what this function does is it returns evenly spaced numbers over a specified interval. Be careful not to confuse this one with NumPy arrange. It works with a different syntax. So let me show you how this works. What this is going to do is it's going to take a starting point, such as zero, and then a stopping point, such as 10. And then the third parameter, if we take a look at shift tab here, it's actually num, which is how many numbers do we want in between this start and this stop. And by default, this endpoint is included. So let's actually show you an example of this. What this is asking for is going from zero to 10, give me three linearly spaced or evenly spaced numbers over that interval, which means it'll return back zero, five, and 10. Notice the space between these numbers, zero and five or five to 10 is evenly spaced and we get back a total of three numbers. So let's expand on this. Let's go ahead and ask for 11 numbers evenly spaced. And this is going to give you back 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Something that sometimes confuses students is why did I have to pass in 11 instead of just 10? The reason for that is because we're actually including this endpoint. So if we go from 0 all the way to 10, that's 11 numbers, not just 10 numbers. So often students accidentally expect 0, 10, 10 to look something that's very easily readable, but instead here you're going from 0 to 10 with 10 evenly spaced numbers. So just keep that in mind, you often have to add one more. So for example, if we're going from 0 to 5, and I want some evenly spaced numbers that are human readable, if I do 21, that gets me back the space of 0.25. So just something to keep in mind, the way linearly spaced works, it's going to include that stopping point. So it's just the start, the stop, and then how many numbers do you actually want there? So I wanted 21 numbers, which means if I were to check the length of this result, it should be equal to 21, the same number I wrote here. Okay. And then lastly, another function you can use is the I function, which creates an identity matrix. While we won't really use this during the course, it is a big part of linear algebra. So in case you're curious of how to create an identity matrix, it's just np.i, and then you pass in a single number. And the reason it's a single number is because an identity matrix is always known as a square matrix. It has the same number of columns and the same number of rows, and it's just a one along the diagonal. Okay, so that's the NumPy identity matrix. We won't really use that throughout the course, but it's worth mentioning since it's quite a common use case in linear algebra. All right, so we just covered a variety of NumPy functions that allow us to create arrays with a defined starting point or stopping point, or with a shape of certain numbers like all ones or all zeros. 
let's go ahead and discover how we can create random distributions of data. Now there are lots of different distributions to choose from, so we'll be covering a few functions here. Luckily for us, NumPy comes with its own full random library. If you say np dot random dot and then hit tab, you'll realize that there's tons of built-in functions and classes reflecting lots of different effects you can use for random data. Now, the first thing we're going to learn about is the simplest, which is this dot rand or dot rand. If you ever have any questions on these, you can always just do shift tab in Jupyter or call help on this function. And then you'll realize it'll give you the full information of what it's actually doing. Dot rand, what it does is you give it a shape and it will populate it with random samples from a uniform distribution over the points zero to one, where zero is inclusive and one is exclusive, meaning it can actually return back zero, but it can't return back one. Okay, the other thing to note here is the keyword that it's a uniform distribution, meaning all those numbers between zero and one have the same likelihood of being picked. So let's just go ahead and ask for one number. And it returns back this array consisting of just a single number that happens to fall between zero and one, which makes sense. All these numbers should fall between zero and one. And every time you rerun the cell, you'll notice it keeps giving us back a different random number. Your numbers should be different than mine since it's also random. Later on, we'll talk about setting seeds. But the other thing to note here is I can also pass in a shape. What's a little different here is that the shape, you actually don't pass in a tuple. Instead, you pass in the number of rows, comma, by the number of columns. So this will return back essentially five rows by six columns. So if I made this five by two and run this, now it's gonna return back five rows by two columns. Okay, and notice all these numbers uh, fall between zero and one, and it's from a uniform distribution, so all the numbers between zero and one have the same likelihood of being returned. Now, often in the physical world, things happen to fall under a normal distribution. So a simplified version of a normal distribution is a standard normal distribution. And we can use np.random.randn in order to create samples from a standard normal distribution. So we can expand on this. And what it does is, is returning from a standard normal distribution. You can check out the Wikipedia page on standard normal distribution for more information on that. But basically all it is, it's a normal distribution where the mean is at zero and the variance is one. So since the mean is at zero and we have a standard normal distribution on top of that, it relates to the fact that we can actually get negative numbers. However, the numbers that are closest to zero have a higher likelihood of being selected than numbers further and further away from it. Okay, so the way this works is very similar to dot .ran. You can either ask for a certain set of numbers, like give me 10 numbers drawn from a standard normal distribution, or you can ask for these numbers arranged in a particular shape. Maybe give me uh, two by three, and that's how it goes. Okay, so again, this is returning samples from a standard normal distribution. Okay, so again, because it's standard normal, values closer to zero are more likely to appear than values further away from zero. So let's go ahead and show you another one, which is np.random.randint which returns back random integers. So if you do shift tab here, you can say a lower threshold and then a higher threshold, which is exclusive. And then it returns back numbers drawn from that. And it does it uniformly. So numbers have the same likelihood. But what's nice about this is they're integers. So it only returns back whole integer numbers. So we can say from zero inclusive to 101 exclusive, so technically only up to 100, go ahead and return back comma however many numbers we want. Notice that it takes in a size argument. So I can either ask for, let's say, five random integers between zero and 101, and it returns back those five random integers, or I can say, give this to me, but in the shape of a four by five array. So I can run that and it returns it back as four by five. Okay, so that is rand int for random integer. You can imagine a use case for this, that if you're trying to model something after people's ages, you could choose zero to 101 as your top and then ask for 
well, go ahead and give me 10 random ages of people there. And there's 10 random ages in years. Again, lots of different ways we can use these random distributions, and we'll explore that, especially a lot more in the visualization section of the course. Something to note here is that when you're using random data and you're running different tests on it, it's very useful to be able to actually set a seed. And the seed is used to set a random state so that the random results can actually be reproduced. Keep in mind, the results themselves are still random, but you're choosing an arbitrary seed number so that you get a particular set of random numbers. And in order to do this, what you do is you say np.random dot seed and then you choose some sort of arbitrary number and by default in a lot of python libraries the arbitrary number choice is 42 which is a reference to hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy if you've read that book and then go ahead and call your random number and make sure you do this in the same cell so let's go ahead and call random dot rand and ask for four numbers so along with your notebook, in the same cell, go ahead and set a seed value of 42, and then in the same cell, ask for four random numbers from between zero and one. And when you run it, you should get back these exact same random numbers. So what the seed allows us to do is set a particular set of random numbers. Okay, so this is going to be really important for being able to repeat uh, random distributions in order to test different models on them or test different visualization methods. So we'll be using set seed a lot throughout the course. A lot of times students ask the question, where does this value 42 come from? Why are we choosing 42? It's just a completely arbitrary choice. You can pass in any number you want in here and it'll return back a different set of those random numbers. But the important thing is that if you were to copy this and run this in a new notebook somewhere, or even in a different cell. As long as they're in the same cell, you'll get back those same random numbers. Keep in mind that if you don't have the seed in the same cell and you start kind of asking for different random numbers again, what's going to happen here is you'll start getting different sets here. But if you ever need to reset the seed, you can always just copy this and then paste it in the same cell run it again, and you're back to those original four random ones. To finish off this lecture, I just wanna quickly go over a couple of useful attributes and method calls you can perform off an existing NumPy array. To do this, I'll first create an array, and let's do it with our NP arrange function that we learned about, and we'll go from zero to 25 here. And if you check out our array, it's right now just the numbers zero all the way up to, but not including uh, 25. And what we can do here is we can actually reshape this by calling dot reshape and then requesting a different shape. So we can do something like give me back this array as a five by five. And notice now it took those same numbers and reformatted it to be five rows by five columns. Something to note here, which is a really common beginner mistake, is if you try to reshape this to be something like five by four, and then call this to execute, you'll notice you'll get this value error. And that's because you can't actually fit 25 elements into a shape that's five by four, because five times four is 20. So you can't squeeze 25 elements into something that only has room for 20. So when you multiply these dimensions together, they should equal the same number of elements you had originally. Next, I wanna show you a couple of useful method calls you can create and that is max min and then arg max and arg min. To do this, I'm just gonna create a random array of integers. We'll say np.random.randint. And then let's go ahead and just say from zero to 101, give me 10 random integers. And your integers will be different, but the same idea still applies. Let's say I wanted to find out the max value in this array. I could simply say dot max open and close parentheses, and it returns back the maximum or highest value. And as you may have guessed, it's the same for dot min, that returns back the minimum value. If you wanna know the index location of these elements, you simply say arg, and you can say arg max, and it returns back one. So that means that this max value of 93 is found at index location one. 
So if we go 0, 1, here we have 93, which means the minimum over here, if we take a look at its location, we can say right here, arg min, and it's at index 5. So you go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and there we have the number 8. And then finally, you can call the data type of an array by saying d type, and it returns back whether you have integers or uh, floating point. And then it'll also refer to the back the fact if it's 32 bit or 64 bit. And that just depends on how much precision your computer is actually holding in memory. And the last thing to note is shape is also an attribute of an existing array. If we take a look at this array that we created of the numbers 0 through 24, if I wanted to know its shape, essentially its dimensions, I could call dot .shape. Note it's an attribute, not a method call. And it returns back that you just have 25 numbers. If I then reassign this to be r dot reshape as, let's say, 5 by 5, notice now my array is 5 rows by 5 columns, and I can check the shape here, and it reports that back. Something to note here is students are often confused by why this is 25 comma nothing. And the reason for that is to essentially distinguish between having an array kind of as one long row versus one tall column. So if I take back this original array, I can reshape it to either be 25 by one, and then I can have it sequenced here as kind of this tall column. Notice the number of brackets here or I can have it to be one by 25. And notice here, we have two sets of brackets here of one row consisting of 25 columns. However, when we originally generated this array, this is just to distinguish the fact that there's only one set of brackets here and it's just 25 numbers, essentially a one dimensional vector. Okay, so that's it for the very basics of NumPy arrays. If you wanna learn more about NumPy beyond what we're gonna cover in this section, you can always visit the documentation, which is at numpy.org. They have a full user guide as well as reference documentation for a lot of the stuff that we cover here. For example, different routines, linear algebra, etc. But everything you need to know for this course will cover in subsequent lectures. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture.